Well, there was plenty of momentum built in Indiana State basketball this past season, and this guy and his staff busy, to say the least, over the last two months since the season's come to an end. And we recap it now here with head coach Josh Schertz. I'm Luke Martin, the voice of the Sycamores. Coach, uh, you've been a little busy. Uh, people would think that maybe you have time to take a lot of vacation and relax. Uh, what has the last two months really been like ever since you guys got back from Daytona? I want the season back. I'd like to go back to the to the when it when it's easier, when there's less stress and uh, uh, and more time, which is actually uh, when the games are played. So uh, spring is is wild. Uh, once uh, once the season ends, um, you know there there's uh, it's it's turned into a season unto itself, right? I mean you you know you play your last game and then uh, it immediately turns to you know who's staying, who's leaving, um, you know retaining uh, your guys. Um, you know, and, and, and you know, who's going to be back and, and who's leaving, how many spots you have to fill, what does your roster need. Um, you know, we kind of knew going into the year we had six, you know, seniors that did not have any more eligibility left after this year. So we knew we were, you know, starting with that. Uh, we did sign, you know, four guys in the early signing period. And, and then, you know, we, we lost obviously a couple. Um, you know, in, in, you know, when we had our, our postseason meetings. And I think, you know, the, the guys we lost, though, and I think the portal in a, in a lot of ways gets a bad rap, and I, I get it because I, I think probably there's a lot to be said for some of the negative of it. But I think with our guys, the three guys who left, um, and for us, it's probably the, the, the good side of the portal in the sense that um, those three guys were all looking for uh, opportunities to play more and have more significant roles, um, and it their transfers and and obviously Cam's going to Marshall uh, and Rob's going to uh, Southeast Missouri to SEMO, and Zach will sign here. He's had some chances to go places. He's kind of waiting on the right fit, but he'll sign here soon. Uh, all three of those guys will be in situations that are probably better for them in terms of their playing time, and then for us, I think. It gave us a chance uh, as a staff to address our needs uh, in terms of what we needed in the spring. We had a better feel for our roster. You always do in the spring than you do in the fall. Uh, you know, what do we need? What do we have back? What are we looking for? How do we put the pieces of the puzzle together? So they're probably going to wind up in better situations for them in terms of what they're looking for individually. And then as a program, we're able to address our needs and probably figure out, you know, some pieces that will help us in terms of what we need to do to be, uh, you know, a championship caliber team next year. It's such a moving piece in terms of what your roster and how in flux it can be during the offseason. That's why we've waited to talk to this point with you. But let's just focus on the guys you've added to this point. What has you most excited about all of them? And where do you feel it's going to increase your team's ability to continue to have success with what you've had? Well, I think, you know, you're, you're going into the spring. We really uh, felt pressure because of what we lost. We needed uh, difference makers, right? And we couldn't just go in and say, well, we want a piece here and a piece there. And it's okay this guy's a role player. We felt like we really need to go out and get uh, difference makers, guys that, that could help us take the next step. I thought um, the jump from year one to year two, um, no jumps are easy. But the, the jump we're trying to make from, you know, 23 wins and to where we want to go to becoming a championship team and, and it is a difficult one. And it's a, it's a uh, you know, it's a, it's a hard leap to make. And uh, we had to have guys we felt like, um, you know, we wanted guys that, that fit. I think when anytime you're looking at um, your team, you're looking at it like a puzzle, right? And, and, and so there, there's always the question of, are they talented enough? And then it's, OK, if they're talented enough, do they fit our system, right? Because we play in a pretty unique way. Are they, they fit our system? You know, can they play the way we play? How do they play inside of this kind of unique style uh, that we have? Um, so that's the second piece. The third piece is, are, are they what we need positionally, right? I, I don't think you can always, like, you know, we talk about this. You can get, uh, you can get guys that are really good players, and it's really about how the pieces complement each other versus just getting a bunch of people who do the same thing. And so it's do the pieces get in each other's way or do they amplify each other? Do they complement each other? They make each other better? You know, how do they help each other? Like I really felt like um, we did a pretty good job when we knew what we were getting with Voss and Voss has his strengths and weaknesses and it helped Cam and Cooper have better years. But Cam also, the way he plays, he's kind of the ultimate glue guy. He was able to amplify Coop and, and Voss and make those guys significantly better, Robbie, et cetera. And so, um, you know, how do the pieces fit together? And so is it the right puzzle piece 
for what we need. And then the last, you know, boxes, you know, do they fit our culture? Are they the kind of guys I want to coach? Are they the kind of guys I want to be around on an everyday basis? Um, do they fit, you know, the, the kind of environment we want to have around our program? And, and so those are really, you know, the four questions that, that for each of these guys, and you really got to be thorough and thoughtful about that because there's a lot of players who might be good enough, but maybe they don't fit our system. And there's guys who are good enough and fit the system. Maybe they're not the right piece we need. We don't need that piece of the puzzle. Or they're, they're, they, they may be, you know, we already have guys who do that. You're replicating pieces. And then, you know, if you have all three of those, then it comes down to, you know, are they the kind of guys I want to coach? Are they the kind of guys I want to be around, uh, you know, for the next nine months on an everyday basis and in the locker room and all those things? And, and so, um, again, really being uh, selective, really being uh, prudent in, in that approach and not wavering and not taking guys that, man, we'll just take a flyer on this or take a chance on that or hope this goes well. Because even if you miss, and, and I don't think we missed at all last year, but I'll say, you know, you look at like, like Trent and Cade and their situations and it probably, they, you know, we probably thought they would have a bigger role than what they had, but they each were you know, major contributors to what we did. But the biggest thing was their character allowed them to handle situations that weren't ideal without imploding the team, right? We didn't miss on who they were as people. And I don't think we missed on them as players either. And like I said, we don't win 23 games without K. We don't win 23 games without Trent. But who they were as human beings allowed them to handle situations that were less than ideal in, in a really mature fashion and and they could have torn it apart from the inside and they never did and and so you got to make sure you're, you're checking all those boxers uh as as best you can you know as we kind of described things are so fluid and as of right now still one spot that you need to fill but i think people hear maybe portal dates and they think oh that's the only time you got to be able to add somebody kind of really focus on what is really the next couple of weeks like in terms of you trying to fill that last spot and also the important dates and really what they mean for you guys as a staff and in terms of that roster management. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we're looking at our team right now. And, and uh, so May 11th is the last date you can enter the portal without having to sit out a year unless you're a grad transfer. So um, for an undergraduate student, a person who has not graduated, um, May 11th is the last day for them to enter the portal. Um, for uh, grad transfers, it extends out to whenever they graduate. Um, you still could go in the portal as an undergraduate after May 11th, but you would have to sit out a year uh, automatically as a transfer, so you won't see that much. You can take people from the portal up until school starts. So our roster spot that we have right now, the scholarship that we have right now, you know, it could remain open till August 20, whatever. Uh, we still have, it could be open for the three and a half months uh, before we fill it. I hope not. And, you know, being, you know, really honest, I, I don't know uh, that we will fill it. You know, I, I've told the staff this, and I mean, I'm very, very happy with where we are with our 12 scholarship players. Um, you know, and then obviously we have, you know, Jaden as a walk on, but we have 12 scholarship guys. I'm very happy with, you know, with that roster. Um, I would not take somebody at this point unless it was exactly the position we needed and I thought they were going to be a significant impact. To get a body, to have a body, to add another piece of the puzzle or you know, muddy the waters in terms of just throwing the guy into the mix, I'm not going to do that. It makes no sense. I'd rather ha hold the scholarship till 2024, wait on a mid-year transfer or, or you know, um, maybe somebody late in the summer that pops available. Um, but I'm not going to just, you know, sign a 13th guy because I feel an obligation to have 13. We got, uh, in my opinion, uh, 12 really good players. Um, we've got a, a, you know, a team that, that could compete uh, at the top end of this league. I think the league is going to be um, better. Uh, I think with, you know, I think we've done really well in the portal, but so has everybody else. Um, and and I think the league, you know, top to bottom. I don't know if it'll be as top heavy. As it was, you had you know five twenty plus win you know teams going to St. Louis, but I do think you know one through twelve, uh, the teams are getting better. I think you're going to see jumps 
from from a lot of those teams that were maybe on the lower end. I think you know Illinois Chicago's done a really good job. Obviously Illinois State's done a really good job and has a lot back. And and I think you're going to see some of those teams. You know Evansville signed some some guys and and making you know Valpo will get there. You know in terms as they add pieces. Um, so I think the the league one through twelve is going to be probably a little um, to be a little more equitable. Uh, you know uh, one through twelve and so um, a little more parity in there. And, and so from our end of it, you know we we think we have a roster that can compete for that um, but and, and without adding anybody uh, teams are really fragile if you had the wrong piece uh, it can it can destroy everything you have so we wouldn't add somebody at this point unless we felt like wow they're going to be a significant impact to our team you know this year or if it's a high school guy we thought man it's a you know a chance to be really special and and then they've got to be a position we need and then it's got to be again uh, the right fit for, for the kind of program we want to have, the kind of guys we want to coach. Before we really talk about your returners and what maybe they will bring to you as you look to this year and the course of the summer and how important it will be, do you feel with the additions that you've had mixing in with the returners that you have, how much more maybe in terms faster uh, your team could be in terms of the speed that you play with? There's so many coaches that I can remember throughout the year that would – compliment you and your team and just say, man, they're so darn fast. Is there a way where you feel like this team next year could play even with a faster tempo? Yeah, I would think we're going to we're going to look different, uh, but I think we could be should be uh, more dynamic uh, offensively and, and defensively. I think we're going to be better, uh, should be better on both ends, although it'll look different. And part of that difference is is how quick we'll be. Um, you know, I, I don't know that there's a faster player in the Valley than Julian Larry. Um, but Isaiah Swope will, will push that. Um, you know, you're going to have two guys that have, you know, uh, blazing speed. Um, I think the amount of skill and playmaking, uh, adding a guy like Orion Conwell, adding a guy like a Jake Wolf, um, you know, their ability to, to play make, to get in the paint, to get by, um, they do it a little bit differently than does Isaiah and or Julian, but with, with equal amounts of, of, of success. And you can't leave out the uh, speed demon, Robbie Avila. You know, I mean, he's been working with Ken, so he promises he's going to get that 40 time under a six. He said maybe in the mid fives. So I don't know if that's 100% accurate, but he told me like five, four, five, five. He doesn't know that it's like four, four for fast people, but neither here nor there. But no, uh, you know, I, I do think uh, we'll be able to play. Um, we'll have a lot more guys who can go and make a play without help. You know, last year, you know, we really didn't have that. It was Jew who could, you know, get his shoulders by without any help. And then everything else was, you know, working together to manufacture it. And our guys did a great job of that. Um, and this year uh, we'll have to, you know, we'll, we'll be a little bit different. But I think we're going to have uh, a lot of quickness. We're going to have a lot of guys who can handle pass shoot, uh, a lot of ability to, to get by people, um, open the floor up and give our guys driving opportunities. And so, you know, I'm excited about that. I think, you know, when, when you look at, it as a as a group, um, you know, we, we couldn't have done to this point, um, in my opinion, any better uh, in the in the portal than we have. I mean, all four of those guys, um, you know, have started this past year uh, at their respective colleges. All four um, had 20 plus point games, at least one. A lot of them multiple 20 point games last year as Division One players. And each one of our returners, I think four of the returners have had 20 point games last year. So we got eight guys who scored 20 points in a Division One game last year on the roster as it is. Um, and and I think uh, those guys, all four of them, uh, they fit, you know, uh, puzzle wise. I think they complement each other really well. And I think, you know, they, they fit in terms of the kind of guys we want to have, the kind of teammates we want to have, the kind of competitors we want to have here at Indiana State. I don't know how much, maybe even publicly, you can say, but what's the gut feel right now of possibly Aaron Gray? Of course, he'll be a part of the team, but in terms of how you feel maybe being eligible this year? Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see. I mean, we're, we're prepared for either, either circumstance. Um, you know, Aaron, you know, is, is a guy, I think there's some circumstances, some external stuff uh, that, that gives us a pretty good, you know, uh, waiver. Uh, to appeal for him, um, but you know, obviously, you know, the NCAA will make that final ruling. Um, but you know, I, I feel like you know, we we went in that knowing that we were going to have Aaron for for two years or for three years, and you know, either way, we felt great about it. Aaron's a guy that we feel like 
you know, projects as a, as a potential all-league guy. You know, he's 6'7", he's probably closer to 6'8", as a guard. You know, made 53s last year. He can, he can get by. He's versatile offensively, defensively. Uh, he's a, he's a high-level athlete. Um, great worker, great kid. And so, you know, we don't know. Um, I think we have, um, you know, we'll, we'll work obviously hand in hand with Joel to, to, to put the waiver together. And, and, and I, I, like I said, I do think we have some, uh, you know, some circumstances that, that give us a pretty good shot. But, you know, you never know. And um, like I said, we, we're prepared for it. Either way, obviously, best case scenario, he's able to play. And if he's not, um, you know, we're, we're, we, we understand that as well. And we, we feel like we have enough with what we have to, to accommodate that and, and, and you know, and, and have enough to certainly continue to yeah, compete at a high level. There were so many good things about last year. You kind of touched up on it, good takeaways. Where do you want to see maybe your team look different this next year? What's maybe an area of whether it's how you played, things you would like to see tweaked? What's maybe the biggest tweak of them all that you would like to see your team this next year to be a better version of itself? Well, I think you know the 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 easy thing is to figure out how to be at your best more consistently. Um, you know, I think we had uh, times where where we were really really good in, in games and stretches, and um, you know, um, and then we would have times where where it looked like you know we would we our, our level would drop, and you're never going to play perfect, and you're not going to play your best every single night or for 40 minutes every night. That's not a realistic thing. But getting to our best version. Um, you know, more consistently, uh, I think is 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 really important. Um, I think figuring out how to uh, how to close games. You know, how to how to finish off games. You know, we had a uh, a really good year relative to you know 23 wins. I think it's you know ties for the most in '79. Um, but we we all feel like everybody feels like you know we left a lot on the table, right? I mean, that's that's the reality. Is is you know I think we lost you know, four games by one point and nine games by five points or less. And so, I mean, you know, it, you know, we have to figure out a way to, to, to close and, and whether that's, you know, uh, getting a defensive rebound. I mean, we were, we were ninth in the country in defensive rebounding percentage, but, you know, three of the losses uh, were, you know, off second chances, uh, not fouling late. We were pretty good about not fouling all year. Uh, and we fouled uh, in, in, in scenarios and, and guys made free throws and, and we had chances, uh, you know, uh, we weren't. And some of that, you know, some of that late game stuff, um, you know, no one wants to hear it. Some of that is luck and randomness. I mean, there's just, you know, things happen or don't happen. I mean, Boss has a three at Missouri State that rattles in, goes out. We lose by two. You know, Coop has a bunny at the rim the last game. You know, we're down one. I mean, as a shot he makes 99 of 100 times, it rolls around and comes out. Uh, um, you could go through it, right? I mean, there, there's a variety of things. Uh, you know, I'm not as mad about it now, but Swope's pull back over Jay Kent to <laughs> – tie it and then you know Jay Kent gets a wide open three you know at the last you know I mean we had we had plenty of of you know there was some randomness to it um but you have to focus on the things you can control right and and so I I think that's that's the deal like can we be at our best what do we gotta do to be at our best more consistently and what do we have to do to close those games because it's not just us it's it's every team in the league like in the Missouri Valley um the sky falls on every team a couple times, right? Like Sky was falling on Bradley when they got beat by 25 by Drake and on national TV, and you know, and and uh, and and Sky was falling on Drake when they were whatever two and three or two and four in the league, and they're not any good. And we were six and zero, then we lost five and zero. Sky was falling on us. We won seven. I mean, so you know how you kind of navigate those things, and and your ability to 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 find your best level most consistently, your ability to withstand all the external stuff, and then you know, um, to, to close games because you're going to be in a lot of close games in this league. If you're good, um, you're going to be in a lot of possession games uh, in the final three minutes where it's, you know, a, a coin flip and, and the team that can, you know, not lose the game is going to give themselves the best chance. And so we have to, to make strides in, in those two areas. You mentioned just some luck, you know, towards the end of those games especially when you're trying to go and get a rebound, which you were such a really good defensive rebounding team this year. Do you feel you like the makeup of your squad that you have now in terms of the size and athleticism of what you have? And if so, do you feel those are areas where maybe you could play a little bit differently, whether that's utilizing Robbie in different ways or getting someone to play alongside Robbie? Just those areas 
where I know at times we've talked about throughout the year areas you always wanted to maybe try to poke at and really patrol just unfortunately just with circumstances didn't totally work out that way yeah I think you know we've we went into the to the spring really feeling like and even in the fall trying to get uh size and athleticism and shooting I thought that was the biggest things you know and and um and you look at how the recruiting has panned out um you know early you know we signed four uh you know and and we get you know Jaden Daughtry is a six seven guard uh, and, and Jaden's a good athlete, not a great athlete, but he's a good athlete, and, and he's physical and strong and ready. Derek Vorst is 6'10", you know, 235, and he can step out and he can shoot. Uh, he can really pass. He's physical. He's different than Robbie in that he's a more physical uh, presence. He obviously, you know, Robbie's, you know, a unicorn in some of the things he can do. You're not going to find another Robbie not Avila. His not his 40 time. He's a unicorn how slow he is, but also in how and, and all the other things he does that, that compensates for that. He plays at open pace. We'll say that. I always told him he's deceptively slow. People look at him and <laughs> think he's one step slow. In reality, he's two steps slow. So that's that's Robbie's how he deceives people. But uh, but he's he's so skilled and so talented and so smart. Uh, um, you know that that uh, he's he's unique, but but Derek's different. Uh, you know Eli Shetler's six six and can really really uh, shoot the basketball. I mean Robbie, if you're gonna if and then in the portal, you know we've gone out and added, added Aaron Gray, who's probably closer to six eight as a guard. Jake Wolf six five. Ryan Conwell's a six four combo, and then Isaiah's you know five ten five eleven. But we feel like we've added size, we've added athleticism, we've added strength um, up and down the roster. Uh, we've tried to continue to to get it, you know, more in the in the you know the vision of what we what we think we need to do to compete at this level. Um, and we were we were a lot closer here in year two than we were in year one. And we feel like, you know, we're going to take a, a similar jump here going into year three in terms of where we are, you know, personnel wise, talent wise, and size and those things. Um, and and when you look at like I think with Robbie, um, it would really it, it's getting the right person to play alongside of him because. Um, you know, the way the game is moved, a lot of people are not playing two bigs together. You rarely see a team that's playing, you know, two true, you know, five men together. Like Rink Mast is 6'9", and he's playing with Leones, but Leones guards one through four. And, you know, Rink Mast is not guarding one through four. And, uh, you know, you just go up and down in the Missouri Valley, a lot of the fours, Domosk, you know, Leones, uh, there's a lot of skilled, you know, small forward slash four men that are playing those spots. So to play a big with Robbie certainly is skilled enough to play as a as a four man or on the perimeter offensively. Uh, you would need somebody that could, you know, guard and let him guard the fathers where um, you know, when we were looking at, at Cam, that was what was intriguing is he could switch and guard, but he could a kind of a five man offensively but had the lateral quickness and athleticism to, to guard really one through five defensively and you could play him alongside of and have two bigs in that scenario. Uh, we couldn't a lot last year with Cade and Robbie just because of, uh, again, the, it's the defensive end, not the offensive end. It's, it's who guards who, you know, defensively. And you got to have the quickness. One of them has to have the quickness to be able to, to guard four men or be able to switch in our switching scheme in the perimeter. And we're not going to put, you know, obviously Robbie in that scenario. Um, and so it would be finding the right piece to play alongside. Do we have that today? No, but maybe that's the piece we're looking for is that, you know, versatile, uh, you know, four that can slide up and play the five that has the size to be a, you know, six, eight, six, nine swing with the ability to slide up and, 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 and play with him and, and, and complement him uh, uh, offensively and defensively. And that's what you're talking about with puzzle pieces, you know, is how do the pieces come to each other? How do they fit each other? Um, and, and at the five, I know, you know, the, you know, you also have, and I think it's, you know, He's been at his best doing it. Not that he's going to do it a ton, but, you know, uh, Jabo, you know, uh, if you look at like early in the year, Ball State, um, before Robbie was playing and Cade was playing, we were playing small. Uh, Jabo's minutes against Peyton Sparks and, and his minutes primarily his, his sophomore year were at the five. He played a ton of, you know, because we, we didn't, you know, we played Simon 10, 12 minutes a game, but Jabo played a lot of the five and he was, you know, all bench and at his best at that position. He's a very good small ball five, like a Draymond Green. Jabo's got long arms, he's strong, he can guard five men. He doesn't have the standing height, but he's got the intelligence, the physicality, the strength to do it. And then on the offense, on the other end, 
they got to figure out how to guard him and his passing and his ability to, to create and shoot and stretch the floor. So there's a lot of different options right now, but certainly that last spot, um, you know, you're threading a needle trying to find a guy, but that's ultimately looking for is a guy we think can be impactful uh, and, and give us that, that kind of big swing to slide up and give us some, some potential in, in needed minutes at the five and play alongside of Robbie some as well. We're about a month away from everybody getting here into the summer in terms of what we'll have, and we'll have plenty of coverage for our fans to be able to get tuned in and know what's going on with you and the guys this summer. But really more why I want to end on Coach Shirts is can you sense the enthusiasm around town and really just the energy level around the program? I'm sure, one, just the difference in your time for when you first got here, but just, one, how it feels to be around Terre Haute now and be able to go out to the local store and run into the fans but two, the impact it's having in your recruiting and, and how it's allowing you to be able to build this roster that you're really excited about. Yeah, I think, I mean, obviously, uh, the, it, it's night and day from when I got here. You know, um, uh, I used to uh, not want to go out to eat before because people would boo me when I went in and we were, we were bad. And now, you know, everybody wants to come up and, and, uh, and, and talk uh, Indiana State basketball. So it's, it's way cooler. Uh, I'm going out to eat much more uh, here in year two. But um, no, and in seriousness, I mean, it, the, that is, I, I tell recruits all the time, you know, uh, basketball is important. A lot of places, it's a way of life here. It really is. It's a way of life in Terre Haute. It's a way of life in the state of Indiana. You don't, you know, state championship game has 15,500 at Gamebridge. I mean, come on, there, there, there's no another state in America that, that, that cares as deeply, that, that is basketball is as much a part of the fabric as it is here at, uh, in the state of Indiana and, and Terre Haute in particular. And I think our guys got their first ever uh, experience of this year of what it what it feels like to be an Indiana State player when you get some of those crowds five thousand you know six thousand basically uh, in the Holman Center the energy the atmosphere um, the people that 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 stood and cheered and you know and and brought that enthusiasm we want to create a home court advantage and you know the two things that go into having a home court advantage one is good players because that's the most important part and the second is having an atmosphere. Where, where, you know, the, it, it, is, it makes it hard on the opponent. And I really thought, you know, as the year went on, we got there to where our, our energy in the building, uh, the way our fans uh, supported us, uh, made a huge difference. And, um, and, and again, you know, we've had, we had a ton of recruits in this year to games, and they see it. Man, look at, you know, it, yeah, it's a great style of play, but look at the crowd, look at the energy, look at the way they support, look at the connection between, uh, you know, the, the players and the community. And, and, you know, people want to talk about, you know, retaining and, and, and recruiting in this, in this era, you know, of, of NIL. And, you know, we have a number of guys that could have left after this year that, you know, would have made a lot more money. And we had a number of guys that could have left last year. You know, you talked about Coop and Cam and all those guys coming back, Calix, uh, that, that were double-digit scorers and all league guys could have left and gone other places. And I think a big reason, you know, any, any program to be successful, it's about recruiting and retaining. You got to recruit at a high level. You got to retain at a high level. Um, our guys, our community, and the way they, the way the people here in Terre Haute care about our players, um, I, I think that makes a huge impact. The way they come out and show themselves support during the games, um, people coming by in the summer, people coming by and recognizing them, you know, when they're out about in public and 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 verbalizing their appreciation. I mean, it, it is. We have a lot of diehards, and and. and I've said it many times, like the, the coolest thing about coaching and playing here is, is the responsibility you feel uh, at this place and, the, and, and you really feel a responsibility towards uh, this fan base to give them, you know, something special. And I think, you know, we have a group that's, that's, that's capable of doing that. You know, I, I think, we, you know, without another piece, we have a group that's capable of doing that. And, you know, every team, you know, when, when you assemble it, you have a level of talent, a level of character. And then the, the headwinds are always the same, right? It's, you know, um, you know, what's the commitment level going to be like? You know, how, how are our guys going to work on a daily basis? Um, how are they going to handle, um, you know, uh, their kind of their, their own uh, personal ambitions, their own agendas, right? Are they going to be able to put aside uh, that for the for the good of the group? Are they going to be able to enjoy each other's success? Are they going to uh, 
kind of sublimate those 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 personal ambitions for the good of the group. Um, what's the internal dialogue going to be like? What kind of teammates are going to beat each other? How are they going to interact? This generation doesn't talk a lot face to face. Teams have to interact face to face. You got to be able to have conversations and it not be personal, and 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 encourage versus discourage each other. Are they going to be great teammates to each other? How are you? Uh, we talk about this all the time, you and I, you know, the noise of seasons, right? Seasons are noisy. And you got all this external noise. You got media. Uh, you got a bunch of people on social media saying, you know, crazy stuff. And if, you know, when you're winning and when you're losing and everything in between, they're noisy. And then you got, you know, the every player's got an inner circle. And you've got people in the inner circle that um, are, are telling the players stuff and, it may be stuff they think is actually in the best interest of the player, but it's probably at odds with what's best for the team, right? And so how do players handle that? How do they handle all the noise from all the external factors, the arbitrary expectations, arbitrary opinions, all the noise, the criticism, the praise, the, the condemnation that comes with a season, how do they handle their inner circle? Uh, giving them, you know, uh, all kinds of stuff they need to do, and again, how do they how do they handle all that, juggle all that, and still do what's best for the team? Then, and then how we respond, right? How do you respond? Are you gonna, you know, we always talk about are you gonna have an observer's mindset or a competitor's mindset, right? And observers can overreact to everything, every win, every loss, every possession, um, you know, and and that's what they're supposed to do. Fans and and media and everybody's supposed to, you know, overreact and and every you know. Uh, Every single possession, every game is a referendum on everything, you know, uh, just like, you know, you know what's coming. Uh, Golden State, L.A., Lakers, whichever one of those teams loses, either Steph or LeBron's a choker. They're not any good. They can't handle pressure. I mean, it's it's coming. Now, I don't know which team will win, but, you know, and, and so you got to be able to have a competitor's mind to understand, you know, the process and respond well to all the ups and downs because, like I said, the sky falls on every team in the Valley once or twice a year. And you got to be able to weather those things. So, you know, we got to answer those questions, but in terms of, you know, and so does every other team uh, in this league that, that has it, that has enough talent and depth to win a championship. And I think we're one of them, but, but certainly we'll, we'll see how we answer those questions and could be more excited about uh, getting this summer started to work with this group and uh, can't wait to get on the floor with them. Well, you mentioned starts here in just about a month. Some teams, I know it's different, but will you have everybody for the summer? We will. Right now, uh, um, you know, all 12 guys on scholarship will be here. Um, if we add one more, certainly. Um, if we added one more later, obviously, that would, you know, just, just depend. But, yeah, plan is, um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm heading out to, to Italy uh, this weekend. So I'm going on vacation, and, uh, uh, and then I'm coming back, and, uh, and we'll be gearing up. We get started June 12th as um, is our, is our first day on the court. And um, can't wait. Like I said, I've, I've, I think we've, you know, um, we've – you know, staff has done a great job of putting together uh, a really good group that come each other and, and, and has a chance to do some special things. And, and, uh, and it's going to be a, a, a really enjoyable group for our fans to watch. And I think it's going to be an enjoyable group to coach. So uh, June 12th, we'll get it rolling and, and look forward to having all 12 of our guys here. And hopefully, fingers crossed, we, we find that needle in a haystack 13th and we got all 13 scholarship guys ready to roll on June 12th. Coach, really appreciate the time you sitting down and give us an update on the program. And June 12th will be here before you know it and get some good Italian pizza as you're across the pond. Yeah, I don't know if Nat will let me, you know, she's always on my, I got to lose weight, so she's probably going to be on me about eating. I don't know what, what, what was healthy in Italy. Probably nothing. So maybe, maybe pizza is, maybe thin crust, thin crust maybe, pizza. Maybe John Shirts could have some pizza, but Josh Shirts may not be allowed. Well, John Shirts did go undefeated this year, and so he's, he is, he is undefeated as a head coach. Josh Shirts, not nearly as successful as John. So yeah, John probably could have some pizza. Probably has a great metabolism. So Josh Shirts, not as good a metabolism as John nor nearly as good a coach, so a lot of work to do. Well, for updates on Coach Schertz's trip to Italy, I'm sure he'll post some stuff on social media for all the Sycamore fans, but for the coach himself, I am Luke Martin. We'll catch up with you in just a little bit over a month away from summer workouts. This is Indiana State Basketball on GoSycamores.com.